Hello, everyone, and welcome to the midweek program at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. My name is Blake, and I'm the education assistant here at the Arboretum. And today we are in the White Garden because, well, there's a very spectacular Arundo Donax in the background. And apparently I've just been subconsciously influenced to pick this spot because we are having a garden conversation today. And our guest today is Shannon Curry, who used to be the marketing director at Hoffman's Nursery, which is a nursery that specializes in grass, hence the big grass in the background. But now she's working with Izell Nursery, which is a native plant brokerage, which makes it as easy as possible for consumers to get their hands on native plants by acting as a sort of middleman between the customer and the nurseries that grow them. All righty. And with the announcements out of the way, I think we can pass things over to Greg to have us a nice little garden conversation with Shannon. Hello, and thank you for joining us. Um, part of, of doing these things is it's, it's kind of a, a it's, it's multifolded and um, some of it is, is selfish and some of it is wanting to, to share um, uh, there's such a great, rich public horticulture, horticulture community here. And when I started here, I wanted to, to, to share that with, with, with you folks. So um, today I'm getting to share one of my favorite people in horticulture. Um, we've known each other for, for, for many, many years. Um, I'm gonna tell a quick story and then we're just gonna talk about um, <laughs> some, of the, some of the things we've done together, some of the things that you do, Great. and um, uh, talk about plants and, and other things. But um, Shannon worked at Hoffman's and, and my entire horticulture career was familiar with, with Hoffman's, uh, been to the nursery to visit, buying plants, and the catalog used to come out. It was fantastic to look at. Um, we we uh, unofficially call it the, the grass Bible in the, in the horticulture world. And Shannon had a lot to do with that. But um, through, through those years of looking at the, uh, at the catalog, we had crossed paths doing lectures, but we, I think we met for the first time in uh, Athens, Georgia. Yes. Um, we did a talk at the Georgia- The Landscape Architecture Short Course. Yes, yes. Was. I looked it up. <laughs> yes, and I'm glad you remember that in Athens. And uh, we got to, to share the stage with, with Michael Durr. Yes, we did. And I oh, remember- that was a trip. I remember, I, I've known him since, since my college days. And I remember they were having some some serious AV troubles, and all he oh, was care man. all he cared about was that when he got ready to do his, his pictures looked nice. Right. So I was the first one, <laughs> and then the he did his, pig. and then, yeah, I was the guinea pig. So oh. um, that that went off with, without a hitch. So um, prior to coming here, you, you've heard me talk about doing prairies and, and other other perennial plantings. Um, it took a visit to Hoffman's to, to visit Shannon, to look at some of the things that they'd done on the property for me to transfer those into things that I was working on. And with a lot of help from, from her and the folks at North Creek and our friend Annabelle at, at uh, Duke Gardens, um, I started doing some of that stuff in, in, in Charlotte and that's gonna kind of carry over here. So selfishly, I'm glad to have you here and glad to, to, to share uh, those stories of, of uh, all those things that you've helped me with um, over those years. And it's nice to have that network of, of people here, um, not just in Raleigh, but that, that extends kind of kind of out and far. So I've, I've babbled oh. and what I, what I wanted to ask you, and I found out some new things walking up here. Um, right. How did you get on this, on this horticulture path? Oh, right. It's, it was circuitous, for a sure. Lot, a, lot of, a lot of them are. A I lot think of, so. Yeah, mine, mine was too. Yeah, was a too lot of us share that, for sure. So I started my work life actually um, as a social psychologist. I moved to North Carolina. I grew up in Northwest Alabama. Moved to North Carolina to attend graduate school at UNC, Chapel Hill, and um, did a PhD there in social psych. Did research, worked on campus. Um, looking at aspects of quality of life and trying to measure that and understand that. Um, for folks who think psychologists and think, you know, yeah. lying on the couch and stuff, none of that. No. Not, not my training, but it was about attitudes and um, how people behave in the presence of others mm -hmm. and thinking about um, how people respond to those in the environment around them. So that was kind of the setup. But, and, I, and I loved what I did. But I found that, you know, looking ahead, I couldn't quite imagine, you know, the rest of my life doing that. And right. meanwhile, 
plants had started to kind of sneak in and um, being a, uh, em being employed by the university system, I found out I could take classes for free, you know, one a semester or something. So I enrolled in Bryce Lane's evening class. The Bryce Connection. A Bryce Connection, of course, and, and started, it was the home horticulture class. And I was like, this is this. This, this, thing, this is it. You were this hooked. Thing. And it was great. I went to Bryce after taking the class and talked to him. He said, great, we would welcome you, but, <laughs> you know, all the caveats. You know, this I, can, is, I can hear his yeah, voice. Absolutely. You know, this is a hobby. This is, you know, turning a, an avocation into a vocation. Yeah. And, he, and he said wisely, he said, take a class from someone else because Bryce knows his power. Yeah. You know, he's, yeah. he's obviously an amazing yeah. teacher and yep. educator. And so I did, and it still was great. And I realized, you know, to make a change. So I came back to school in horticulture uh, here at state. Um, did, didn't, didn't graduate, but took classes, really started to become involved and just fell in love with it. Yep. Um, and then did, did a few things. I worked, as I said, I worked at Niche gardens for a semester or a semester <laughs> you can tell i rolled from that into but did a, a fall there i worked with um, a local landscaper for a while um, and did a few things but then found a home at hoffman nursery for the next 15 years wow yeah, I know. yeah it goes by it goes by quick yeah um that's 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 interesting uh, a, a lot of people, you know, myself included, kind of start out in, in other ventures, and uh, it's always uh, plants yeah. that kind of kind of reel, reel us reel us back in. Okay. So, kind of um, explain. Uh, we all know what you did your, at Hoffman's and your influence, but kind of your your focus, and that kind of leads into what you're doing now. It does. It does. So, I I, I actually started at Hoffman kind of in 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 the first probably five or six years, moved around in different positions, mm -hmm. which turned out in the long run to be really valuable because I was kind of filling slots that opened up as they and I figured out mm -hmm. where do the skills I bring fit. And that's where, you know, some of it was having this background as a social scientist. So looking at things like data or research or being able to do that and talk the language. And so it gave me a connections to universities and to researchers and people that mm -hmm. became really valuable, um, but moved around a bit. And then the person who was handling their marketing needed to leave for family reasons. And I had been helping out with the catalog and, and doing some writing because again, being in a academic career, yep. writing was a big part of that. So um, I kind of slid into what was we called marketing and stayed there. Um, there were some times when I helped manage the sales team, again, as people kind of rotated in and out mm -hmm. of the nursery. But primarily what I think I and most of us thought of me as, as an educator, mm -hmm. that I would research the plants, write about the plants. Um, having worked in different departments a little bit, you know, I could, I could understand what production was doing and talk to them and say, how does this work? Right. Explain to me. And then write about that. Yep. You know how it is when you're when you when you need to understand it and to write about it. Yeah. You have to get a more a deeper understanding of it. It's a side of the nursery world that I don't think a lot of people appreciate or, or understand. And for me, you know, that's that's usually the first point of contact is is a catalog. Mm -hmm. um, now it's it's website, but even tying those things together you know, we would see each other at trade shows all the right. time. Yeah. And that was that's a huge opportunity to network and see people. Oh, it is. But so much of what <clears throat> most people are looking at is we kind of know in our heads what we want, but how do you make things that are new, attractive, and not just to people that understand, you know, we were talking right. about the vernacular, uh, Latin right. names and, and yeah. common names, but people right. that go, go down to the family level of plants mm -hmm. up to, you know, people that are new in landscaping or design that don't really know. And it's something that's really, to me, it's, it would seem really hard to do to, you know, make that, make that presentable, make it functional, 
um, you know, cost effective too, because, you know, traveling and, and developing all that stuff is important. And that was always one of the things that I was fascinated with that, that Hoffman's did is that was done so well. Mm -hmm. um, and you could look at the catalog or you could meet somebody like you or anybody and they knew the whole scope of the operation and the in the ground kind of stuff too. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about that because were you involved with that at all at Hoffman's or? I Early on, I helped out with um, the trials yes. program, you yes. know, and it, it was has had various levels of formality over the years, but that was the really cool mm -hmm. early part for me was being able to, you know, we'd bring plants in or people would talk. I mean, John Hoffman knows everybody yeah. in horticulture, it feels like, you know, yep. he's, but when you think of grass, there are, there are just a few nurseries really that you think of and Hoffman yeah. was one of them for sure. And so grasses would come in. And so for a while I helped coordinate that program where okay. we'd, you know, um, put the grasses out, try them out, keep track of them. I mean, I do love data. So um, I loved collecting that, cataloging that, figuring out and connecting it with what we were trying to get from growing those plants right. and, and, you know, talking to the growers. I mean, the people who are handling the plants. Yeah. I didn't do much of that, mm -hmm. but what I got to do was walk the greenhouses. And every time, you know, there's a yeah. grower there working and every time I talked to a grower, I learned something new. Oh yeah. You know, I was like, oh, this is, you know, just watering is a complicated endeavor. You're yeah. getting it right. Watering lights, humidity, yeah, you know, all of that. Wind, movement, all that, all, all that, that stuff. Yeah, it's it's crucial to, it to is. plants. And so that that process of learning through the trials was part of what I did. And and when I started working with the marketing content or doing the catalog, the website. There was already a ton there that was really good. Yeah. The, the person who'd been working there was fantastic. Um, and and I got to step into this tradition of really wanting to get good information mm -hmm. and having it be helpful for people. Like, how do you use it? How does it work? Um, being being an authority, if you will. And, and that's really what I think we built over time was a place that people knew they could go to find out about grasses right? and to feel confident that what they were getting yeah. was accurate. A, a um, solid resource um, yes, that yes. time and time again, you can, you can turn to. Right. Right. Yeah. But, but yeah, traveling and getting to meet people. And for me getting, you know, when we, when you visited uh, yeah. you and Phil, I think Phil Douglas yep. visited and, you know, talking to people at public gardens about what they're doing, what's working, what's not, yeah. you know, that it was the interaction that was important. Mm -hmm and understanding and just hearing that and that informs everything that happened in terms of writing and thinking about the plants. Yeah. Um, that was, you know, what a privilege. Um, yeah. I, I feel, I feel the same know? way. I mean, it's such a, it's, <clears throat> it's such a cool network of people yeah. um, at all levels in horticulture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, <clears throat> it was always like old home week to go back to the, the, you know, the trade shows and stuff oh, yeah. to, to see everybody. But it also was a, you know, <clears throat> I always had homework to do. I had <clears throat> people I wanted to see, <clears throat> excuse me, uh -huh. things that I wanted to do, um, plants that I was looking for. You know, I would, <clears throat> I would have a list of things to, to check right. and I have to visit this person and that person. And you had to do like this, this, this surfing where uh -huh. you would go by the booths and you know they're always the popular ones that were packed full of people. And I, you know, I'd, I'd see people's heads over. <laughs> And, you know, yeah. people go. I'll come back later. Yeah. <laughs> and, and do that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I, I consider myself very lucky. Um, part of it is just, you know, attrition and age. I've been doing this for a long time. So I, I know a lot of people. <laughs> but, um, and, I, and I talk about it a lot with, with folks, probably, probably too much. No, but it, it, it's, it's, you know, to know that I could, I could pick up the phone and talk to Phil or, or ask you about something right. or you know, David Hyde at Panamerick Farm or whoever in the, right. in the nursery world. And, you know, not only were they uh, friends and allies, but they had resources and, and things like that. And if they didn't, somebody else did. And I really like that about that. Um, that it's interesting, you, you th that nursery connection, I think is, is part of what um, I got to work on quite a bit because <clears throat> we realized, you know, as, as a business in a nursery, you realize, um, there are people who are 
for example, landscape architects or mm -hmm. design professionals who are specifying plants and want to learn about the plants, but they aren't the people buying the plants. Right. But they're kind of what what um, some folks call the tastemakers. They're yeah. you know, and there's not always this direct connection between the design professional specifying plants and the contractor who's installing and sourcing the plants or the client, yeah. or if it's a public garden, <clears throat> you know, right. there may be many players involved and often it felt like there was a real disconnect. And so part of what um, we did at Hoffman and I, and I still now is, is in my mind and with, with Izell is to working with design professionals Helping them understand plants better only helps all of us. Right. It helps our public spaces because yeah. they're making better choices and seeing the nursery industry as a resource, mm -hmm. as an authority, because design professionals can't know everything. No, and and, and, and being willing to admit that you don't know everything and, and take that advice from, from people in that, that realm is, is important. Um, I'm not shy to say that I don't I don't know something, and I've learned a lot over the years that I've done this. But that's that's a really really important part of that yeah. that dynamic is relying on on those folks to to give you that that, that yes. good that good information. Right. Um, I had a big thought, and it just kind of vanished. Um, bouncing around a little bit and yeah. maybe this this thought will float back into my brain oh sure um talk about what you're doing now i don't okay. want i don't want to lose sight of that because oh, right, I, I will right. i will well it was it was a really nice segue so I, I i'd been at hoffman for 15 years and and really just kind of needed a break mm -hmm. it was time it was time for a change and took some time off um i also was really excited about having a broader plant palette. I mean, I love grasses and mm -hmm. I still talk about them a lot. I love learning about them, writing about them, but, but really wanted to expand that. And my interest in, in sort of commitment to native plants in mm -hmm. particular had become stronger. Um, I'm certainly not a natives only person, but I'm right now where I am, I'm way more interested in that. Mm -hmm. That to me is in blending what some of the exciting work that's going on in planting design yep. worldwide. And can we blend that with what's happening with native plants in the U.S.? Yep. So um, I knew um, the folks from Izell, um, Claudio Vasquez and Amanda McLean founded it. And I knew about them through Hoffman because mm -hmm. Izell serves as, it's a it's a web-based business that um, works with grower partners like Hoffman Nursery, North Creek Nurseries, mm -hmm. Piso, um, uh, Native Plant Nursery, Kind Earth Growers, mm -hmm. some really, really excellent growers and that focus a lot on, have a big native plant palette. And so through Izell, an end consumer can go to the website and order plants from any of these nurseries. So one order plants from all those and get plugs so it can get this plug. So yep. we had been working at Hoffman, had been working with Izell. So I knew them, we had shared, you know, content because mm -hmm. they, they enjoyed a lot of what we did and found it valuable. So we would share content. And so I knew them. And so after when I, uh, they heard I was leaving Hoffman, you know, we had a few conversations and then um, they said, they are looking to expand their content and to have more of an outreach. Um, it, the business was growing, it was very successful, and yep. their team was just not able Keep to up. do more than they were doing. Yeah. And so it was just a really great fit. Um, Good timing. It was, it just, it, it, it was unbelievable how it just happened. Cause I was really honestly gonna take more time and kind of just <laughs> <laughs> chill a little bit, but it, it, it was there, the timing was right. And um, it's been fabulous because I, um, we kind of hit the ground running we wanted me to do more talks and presentations mm -hmm. with Hoffman. That was a big part of what I did. Yep. But most of those talks were to industry. You know, you and yeah. I yeah. cross paths doing that. Talking to the same people every yeah. year. Yeah. Right, right. Trade shows, you yep. know, doing those kinds of things, which I loved. Yeah, absolutely. But this was a chance. What we weren't able to do very often was to do community-based talks. Mm. Because those, there's so many. Yeah. And there's a demand for it. And we just didn't have the resources to do it. So... With Izell, we certainly um, have customers that are landscape contractors, landscape architects, designers, industry people, mm -hmm. but 
a lot of them are end consumers or yeah. home gardeners or, or you know, um, um, garden enthusiasts, you know, we, we say. And it's, it's nice to be able to, we have a wide web of people we can get plants from, but most homeowners right. can't. Right. And anytime I've done talk and I'm showing these things, somebody inevitably will stand up and say, I know you can get that stuff, right. but how am I ever Where gonna get I it? Where can I get it? Right. And you know, why are you talking about these things that we can't have? Oh my gosh. So it's, it's nice that that's there. And I think even more so, um, you know, native plants in particular are, are nice. they're, hard, they're hard to find and hard to find good quality growers. Um, and then the side of things that I think is really important. And, mm -hmm. you know, you talk about kind of revolving um, interests and in, in, in career. That's that's the big thought I had. I just found ah. it. Um, having having revolving thoughts and, and things to, yeah. to be interested in, um, you know, plugs are a, a great way to get things established. Yes. And just the palette of plants available mm -hmm. with somebody like North Creek and, and Hoffman's and, and the others, but most people, you know, they're not going to be able to to, 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 no. to to experience that or get that. They're going to get something that's been stepped up, maybe. Right. And that's at least they have that avenue. But I think that's a that's a good a good niche to to, to have. Um, and before I lose the thought again, oh, yeah. I want to expand a little bit a little bit more on that. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, natives and the the, the the importance of that to you now. Um, you know, having such a, a heavy woody plant focus most of my life and, and perennials too, but, you know, doing that, that prairie for me was kind of a, a big aha moment because uh, it was such a, yeah. you know, from a sustainability standpoint, mm -hmm. diversity and, and all that stuff. And, you know, talking with you and Annabelle and other people and, and diving deep and visiting other places that are doing similar mm -hmm. things visiting North Creek and all the stuff that they've done, um, you really see the potential to impact community. Yes. And one of our favorite places that, that I talk about too much, the, the art museum, oh. where they've, they've, they've really kind of embraced that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just that, you know, the, 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 I went there before, like when it early, early was developed, I was, uh, came down for a garden writers meeting and a friend of mine and uh, two of us went out there to, to check it out and mm -hmm. spent half the day there, it was great. Yeah. But to go there and, and now to see it through winter, oh, okay. spring, summer mm -hmm. and starting to ease into fall and all those <clears throat> big sweeps of grasses and perennials in the parking lots and mm -hmm. the, the trees and stuff. And then just to walk through the, the whole thing, it's, it's such a magical place. And that's, that's become something that really scratches an interest in, in, in me. And, and certainly, you know, the diversity of, of being someplace like this, too. So it's funny how, yes. um, you know, what does Mark say? There's, there's, there's so many plants to, that, to, to kind of latch on to um, and not just kind of get pigeonholed into, into one thing. But that's, that's been a, a cool part of, of what I do. So I um, want to talk a little bit. Another thought popped in my head. Yeah. Um, you know, doing these talks, doing these lectures, what are, what are some things that you, you like about going and, and doing? I always wonder how, oh how, how people, you know, when you do a lot of them, um, like I, I, will, I will look at this later on and I can't stand to hear myself talk. I, 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 absolutely, I absolutely hate it. I understand. Um, and, and I think about doing, doing talks and I, I hate to do the same one over again. Uh, like, yeah. like I try to change things up a little bit, not to the point I had a colleague at Bartlett that as they were introducing him, he would be walking up to oh. the podium on his laptop, <laughs> changing things Still and then sit down tinkering. and plug it in and then, and then go. Wow. Wow. I mean, that I can't do. No. I have to have no. kind of the framework. But what do, you, what do you like and maybe some things that you don't like about doing that? Yeah. I, well, first of all, just the, ex I get, I get excited yeah. about talking to people about yeah. something that we connect about, you know, that they get excited about right. too. And that's what, you know, you're saying earlier, um, getting people excited about plants and they can't find them. Yeah. Like that was one of the things like, oh, I talk a lot about sedges, you know, and that, and, and I can actually get people excited about sedges. It's a, it's, a, it's an uphill thing, but, yeah. and so I, I could never, there was never a place for them to to be able to find those. The, the red ones well, in here somewhere right, with the red well, flowers. We'll, uh, we'll take a look at it. Yeah. But, um, but so that excitement and that connection is really part of it. But I do, I, I, as you noted, I don't do the same one every time. So yeah. I, it matters where I am. True. You know, um, and especially with native plants, not, I mean, not every gardener is, 
is really um, focused on getting plants native to the region. But there are people who care deeply about that. So yeah. I want to honor if that's the group I'm talking to, sure. they care about that. I'm going to make sure that I'm addressing that. And yep. I'm, so I'm always screening what is the plant palette I'm talking about. Yep. Um, is it appropriate for them? And mm -hmm. also the, the level. I mean, just their experience. Um, sure. I uh, taught a class yesterday at Duke Gardens. Mm. And, and almost everyone there was new to grasses. Oh, wow. And I thought that. You know, I'm biased. I'm like, is anyone new to grasses? But apparently, all the know, hands. Oh, yeah, yeah. It all was, the hands went up. They yeah. did, and so that was cool. But I did kind of switch gears and go, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna have a little bit different approach here. We got to start with the basics. Like, what is it? Yeah. How is it different from this or that? And so, I actually like. It takes up a lot of preparation, mm -hmm. but I do really like being able to to go to people with something that fits them yeah. and what they're looking for. Yeah. Um, you know, and the travel's exciting sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes, <laughs> not always. Sometimes like, uh, you know, it's, it's um, and it's, I, I love doing it. It's, you know, preparing for it, all that stuff sometimes is stressful when you're trying to do other things, yeah. you know, there are deadlines with that. And, yeah. and that piece of it, yeah, you know, but um, I, it is, uh, I also love hearing what other people think about it. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, um, I find myself at this point in my career, I go, well, I guess I kind of do know some things about some things. And I, I have some things to say about that, that are maybe, I know more than your average bear. Yeah. Right. So, but I also recognize there could be people that I'm talking to that could walk up and do the same lecture I'm doing. I'm very and do conscious it better. of that. Do it yes. better. You know, especially depending on the group. Yes. But, but I bring something unique to it. But I recognize the people I'm talking to yeah. are bringing their own unique perspective. So I love yeah. getting to connect with that. Yeah. That's the part that yeah. you know, really is exciting. Yeah, it's, it's nice to, you know, the whole process of, you know, I, I like preparing for them. I like going through my yeah. pictures. I wish I could organize my pictures better. That's, that's a whole nother talk. Oh Lord. Yeah. Um, but I, I like that process. Um, I, I like kind of th figuring out who the audience is and, and what, they, what they're what mm they -hmm. interested in. And, you know, the whole preamble of being there and talking to people before you do your thing and then listening to the other people, which is fascinating because I always learn stuff from the other speakers that are there. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm never nervous. Um, I'm more mm -hmm. excited than anything to do that yeah. kind of stuff, but yeah, and then the the feedback and the and the questions afterward are are always it's it's always fun to, just to to hear to see what people got out of what you said. Yeah, and a lot of times yes. they they may have missed things, and then you you know what did I what did I not do right to kind of to kind of lay oh, yeah. lay stuff out. But it's it's always a learning curve every time every time you walk up and start talking to a group of people. Oh, it is. In fact, as I said yesterday, it was I was talking about sort of um, which which kind of connects, believe it or not, <laughs> to the idea of the prairie or, or kind of that, what I think of as sort of ecologically focused mm -hmm. kind of planting design. And I was talking about those layers in a landscape. So, you know, from planting in a post wild world, what yeah. Claudia and Thomas are doing. Love um, that book. So, you know, and th those layers. So I always start with the ground plane because that's where the sedges are. That's yep. where the grasses, the short grasses are. You know, I always start there and build up. There's the ground cover layer a seasonal theme, um, structural layer, and then mm -hmm. their fillers. And one gentleman said to me recently, he said, he said, well, I, I think when you're installing, he said, wouldn't you really? He said, intuitively to me, it feels like you'd start with the structure and then go down to the others. And I thought, well, of course you would, right? That, that yeah. and certainly in installations, that's my understanding. You know, people, you're putting in your big, structural plants, mm -hmm. then you go and you create those patterns mm -hmm. and colors, and then you're filling in, yeah. you know? And so I thought, wow, d you know, does it affect the way people are thinking about this and learning it if I'm presenting it the opposite of the way you do it? Right. And I don't know. I mean, I'm usually leading with the grasses and the sedges. Right, <laughs> so, right. But it was just a really cool thing to have that perspective flipped. Yeah, an ob an and now I'm going to think about it. Like, hmm, will I restructure a little bit? Hmm. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. 
I don't know if that's a, a good segue for questions or we could we could we could keep on keeping on. We could. Uh, well, I'm noticing that some people are having difficulty kind of wrapping their minds around like what Izell Nurseries ah, is. Right. Somebody asked, like, are you a wholesale nursery or a retail right. nursery? Ah, let me I'll, I'll yeah. let me hit that. Thank yeah. you. Blake. So first, we are not a nursery. So Izell is actually where Izell native plants and we are. The, the, what we are is a website. So there are, we do not hold any plants and we don't grow any plants, but we work with growers who do. So our website, you can go to our website and we have, we work with these nurseries so that when you order from us on our website, you can get those plants shipped directly from the nursery to you. And so it's it's almost like um, a broker. Yeah. That's an easy way for people to think about yeah. it. So let's say you want, uh, you know, pink muley grass from Hoffman and you want, um, you know, uh, a, a flowering perennial that I'm blanking on at the moment from <laughs> North Creek. Baptisia. Baptisia, thank you, from North Creek or uh, Chrysogonum, one yeah. of my favorites, you yep. know. So you want those and then you want something else. Um, Kind Earth Growers does a lot of really cool, unusual species that aren't as common. So you can do that, which is why it also works really well for some um, landscape designers, because yep. it's like, ugh, rather than dealing with ordering Each, directly. Right. Um, and so we broker that so that um, an end consumer, so someone who doesn't have, for example, a wholesale account. Yep. I mean, there are nurseries that, you know, there are barriers to buying from a wholesale nursery. You have to be in the industry. Yep. Often there are minimums. Yep. Um, I know at Hoffman there was a there was a minimum. I'm sure there still is. Yeah. Um, or you have to have a wholesale. You know, it, it is wholesale, so you have to have a tax ID number. Yep. They don't. You know, there's a whole rigmarole. And it's hard. There's a layer there. And, and people don't understand too. When I try yeah. to explain it, it's yeah. hard for those big nurseries to have to have a whole level of staff. Yeah. And I mean, just think about people coming to the nursery. Um, they're just not set up to, to do that kind of no. stuff. They're set up to produce lots of plants. Right. There's equipment buzzing around. They don't have staff that are gonna, you know, uh, Bob McCartney um, at Woodlanders Nursery one uh -huh. time, um, very first time I ever went to see him, um, talking to him on the phone. He said, if you want plants, you need to order them. You can't get them when you get here. And yes. I was like, okay. So I went down, I literally had a blank check for my boss and I got down there spent the day with them, had lunch, walked through the nursery and I was like, can I, can I get some stuff? And he's like, no. No. I'm like, what do you mean <laughs> no? I was like, I got a check. He's like, you know, he said, here's why. He's like, I've got two people that work here and somebody will come in off the street and they would go help and they'd pull a bunch of plants out and then they would change their mind and get in the car and drive away. And then uh -huh. I've got to put all the plants back and I didn't get to do this, I didn't get to do that. And I was like, okay, I, I understand it. Yeah. But, and he still wouldn't, wouldn't sell right. me the plants. Wow, that's so I, I, tried to, I tried to explain that to people. It's easier for someone like us to, to shop wholesale because we're getting large numbers of things. Right. We're ordering them online or talking to somebody mm -hmm. like, you know, a sales rep or somebody. Right. And it's a, it's, a, it's a streamlined process that's set up for that. It's not set up for, mm -hmm you know, somebody that's going to get a handful of things. So that's what's so great about what you do. It is. It, it, it allows people to access sizes, plugs, smaller sizes, diversity. and diversity yeah. of, of, you know, the catalog, if you will, without, that they just normally couldn't. And, right. and that's what I, I, you know, sometimes when you're steeped in something, mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult to, to understand what it's like not to know that, that industry or how yeah. it works. And, yeah. um, and actually I just, wrote a, an article for a, mag, a consumer magazine about plant sizes and sort of how that works in, you know, there's a process that, you know, you have little yeah. starter plants and, and then they get potted up and stepped up into, there's a middle nursery somewhere in there. And then there may be a finished yep. nursery and then it may go to garden center. So there are a lot of touches that I realize are not yeah. at all obvious. To, and to and somewhere in that circle is somebody's trying to figure out what this plant, that this plant's going to be popular five, 10 years oh, down yeah. the road <laughs> and that it's right. going to perform well and be something that people are going to want. And it's not, you know, it's not toilet paper. You know, they run out of, right. they run out of Baptisia and then they just make a bunch more. Right. You know, it's got to go through that oh, stage of, of, of development. And 
<clears throat> and with Woody's, even longer. Wow, you even, really even, even you longer. stretch it out. Yeah, yeah you know, and, and things have to be pruned and fertilized, and right. then all you need is, you know, one bad winter, you know, one bad night of uh, right. power going out in a, in a house or something horrible. Um, long story yes. short, it's really hard to, to run a nursery. Um, oh, yeah. It's not it's not for the faint of heart. That's 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 for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. I, I was gonna, real quick to note, you were talking about predicting, you know four or five years out, what's yeah. going to be popular. So one of the, I'm, I'm very involved with the Perennial Plant Association. Yes. And so one of the things that we do as an organization is, is name a perennial plant of the year. Mm -hmm. And we're naming, we, we actually just started, we've already got the 2026. Oh, wow. Right. And you think, oh my gosh, that's so far out. There's a reason because we let our members know that's part of, you know, members get a privilege of knowing ahead of time because we work with young plant suppliers, so somebody has to start creating stock. And then that has to get stepped up and that takes several years so that it's, you know, hanging out in the garden center for you. Yeah, when you release that new plant, people are gonna want it. Right. So it has to be started right. way back to then, right. come to right. that point. And so yeah. we're trying to decide, oh, is it too new? Is it too old? You know, like how is it, yeah. is something quote better going to come along in the interim and, and you know it's still it's a bit of a guessing game yeah um i mean it's an educated guess and a pretty yeah. well educated guess but it's still there's a bit of forecasting that that goes on stressful there. very stressful <laughs> <laughs> so <Yeah>. stressful <laughs> where are we with questions okay well so somebody asked before you clarified what izel does they asked how will izel introduce natives to retail nurseries and big box stores signage they asked so like I can't um, imagine that that's the goal that they no, would be in no. big box stores, but you guys do education about plants. We do, we do. So that, um, and, and I know some of this really just from having been in the industry and having discussions and, and, and from the Perennial Plant Association mm -hmm. is something we think about um, because what we hear is there's a disconnect between the popularity that we know is there for native plants and the availability that, that garden enthusiasts, home gardeners yeah. are, are feeling, you know, I, I, I tell people they're, you know, we, um, people say we can't get these things sometimes. And, you know, I always want people to go to their local garden center, their independent garden center is where I'd say go first. Uh, same, same. But, but often it's not even reaching them. And mm -hmm. some of it has to do with supply and demand getting, in sync and we're still not there. Yeah. Um, and there are, it breaks my heart, but there are crops of native plants that I know get dumped because they haven't sold. Yeah. You know, and, and gosh, wouldn't my mission be great if I could like marry the projects yeah, yeah. with the dump, but it, timing doesn't always work. We no. try, but no. so, so Izell is not as directly involved in that because we really are mail order. We are direct to consumer, but we care about it and we want people to be able to get plants, even if they don't get them from yeah. us. So um, big box stores are looking at what they call sell-throughs. They, yeah. they need to know and they only are gonna keep stocking what sells. So, um, and getting, um, getting that connection between supply and demand is still really not there. And it, it's hard with big box stores too, because they have expectations that every single one of those plants is gonna look exactly the same right. and they're gonna be healthy. They're not gonna go through dormancy. Um, right. And you know, and the numbers that they need, it's just, you know, you're not just shopping at your big box store here, it's all of them. And they all have right. to have that supply to kind of feather through through all of and them. it needs to be showy the right time of year. Yes. You know, and native plants and, and certainly, you know, th there are a lot of blanket statements that get made about native yeah. plants, some of which are not not true, some are, but yeah. you know, there are ones just like with introduced plants that are to have a very long production time mm -hmm. or are very challenging to do or yeah. have parameters that make them, they take a lot of time or labor or resources to produce. And so some are, are more expensive and they just price themselves out yeah. of, of a commodity kind of right. mentality. It, a lot of native plants take longer to go through that, that setup that you mentioned of either seed or cutting right. to marketable size. And some just don't like that process at all. Right. Um, they're not, not quite that easy. I think going back to the question, I think indirectly, yes. right. you know, when you're doing talks <laughs> and lectures and stuff, 
you're promoting those things and hoping to reach those audiences that that need to hear that information, be they big box stores or, or whatever. And, you know, also the same thing when you're at trade shows and you're talking to people, you're reaching some of those some of those audiences. Right. Um, it's a it's a it's a good fight that that we do on a on a pretty regular basis. But, you know, it's not what you guys are, are set up to do. No, although we, we, we do, I think, inform that process. Because, mm -hmm. for example, through our growers or when we have people ask us for plants, we're funneling that information back to the growers to let them know, you know, people are asking about this. People do want to see yeah. this set of plants yep. or, or helping the industry see that there is demand out there. And a lot of the the nursery folk that we jointly know yeah. and, and interact with, they're listening for stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Um, they're always looking and asking those mm -hmm. kinds of questions. Um, right. uh, I always think about David Hyatt at Panoramic Farm, yeah. who's always, his brain is always going. Right. And he's always trying to think of things like, like that. Um, so a lot of the, the really good folks are receptive to that, that kind of stuff. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. we've talked about native plants multiple times, mm -hmm. and that's where for me, having those connections and say like, tell me about where you are with this. Yeah. What are the barriers? Yep. What's not working or what are you finding? Because if folks like they can't figure it out. Yeah, <laughs> it's not gonna you get know, figured right, out. Right, right, so it's we not got, gonna happen. But what can we do to help that? So it's, yeah. it's, I think there's, you know, all these connections as conduits for information, mm -hmm. as making connections between people really helps build that. And, yeah. and, um, and that's what's been really fun for me is to move a little closer to folks in the native plant movement, mm -hmm. into those groups. It's a, it's been really great to kind of cross over Izell's network mm -hmm. and my network that's more industry um, and from a different perspective has been really fun yeah, I've not um, thought for, about that. for all of us. Yeah, 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 it's been great. Yeah. Okie dokie. Well, Sharon had an interesting question. She asks, when placing a plant order to be shipped to a specific state or region, are the plants that are shipped from that area's genetic stock? She says plants with genes adapted for NC might not do well in Michigan or Maine, even though the species might be native to all these oh, areas. Oh, great. It, wow. We could spend like two yeah. hours on that one. At but at the, least. the short answer is so that's something we, we do think about, we care about. Um, and, and that is one of the challenges in the industry is um, when one produces at that level of, of so let's say like a regional, um, uh, uh, um, you know, oh gosh, I'm blanking on the word, uh, yeah. not phenotype, genotype, you know. You know, it'll, I, co it'll come. I know, <laughs> it just left me, but uh, that's terrible. I can't think of it. It's not progeny, is it? No. I think we know what I'm talking about. Uh, plants that, that are um, ecotypes, yes, that's ecotype. what I'm looking that's for. It. Thank you. So the ecotype, um, growing those means you're typically gathering and sort of how, what range of ecotype is one looking at? Is it 50 miles away? Is it 100, 150? Mm -hmm. So um, there's regionality at different levels. And producing that to scale is really difficult. So small nurseries can do that, but big nurseries that can be difficult. So there are all kinds of, you know, profit issues and margins yeah. and all that stuff. But to, to answer Sharon's question um, in a very circuitous way, um, for Izell, we have growers in different regions. So we typically suggest to people, we ask, they enter a zip code so we know where they are. And we suggest to them that they, we show them what growers have what plants. So they get to choose. So you as the, as the you know, buyer get to decide where you want your plants to come from. And we encourage people. Yeah to buy closer to them rather than further, because it makes it more likely that they'll get plants yep. that are native to their region or closer to their ecotype. That said, we also know in the nursery industry and in a wholesale grower, they vary as to where they get their seed or where they get their divisions or where their stock plants come yep. from. So some nurseries may be growing and gathering local ecotypes, some may not. Um, so it doesn't guarantee that, but if you're buying from a nursery that's closer to you in proximity, you, you have a good sense that the environment that that plant's been grown in is a little more similar, but yep. you know, the genetics are complicated and, and that would be ideal. Yeah. But it's really, and you, this ties back to something you mentioned yeah. earlier. It's really important to champion your local nurseries, yes. garden centers, first and foremost, because it, it behooves us to keep them in business so we can all get plants from them locally. Mm -hmm. But um, tying back to the question, 
you know, the nursery industry, I, I would say, and I'm, this isn't scientific and I may be wrong, but my perspective is it's getting smaller. Uh -huh. There are less and less people growing plants and that's, that's for a wide range of things. It's not easy, um, it's not always profitable, and it's sometimes it's more profitable to sell property than to keep it in a nursery, mm -hmm. but it's gonna be harder to find that regionality in a lot of areas because there may not be any growers in, in some, some particular mm -hmm. areas. We're lucky here in North Carolina to have good nurseries pretty much all across the state. Right. And we interact with a lot of those people here and you're tied into those people as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, it's a great thing to, to strive for but a lot of times it's it's just not not feasible. And I will say, <clears throat> my our friends and colleagues uh, down the down the road in, in uh, UNC Chapel Hill Botanic Garden, uh, a lot of the things that they're selling in their you know their plant yeah. sales and the gift shops, those are things that they've they've got from there. So they really champion that or are looking at those sorts of things too. So good work to to Dan and all the folks there for 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 doing that stuff and and keeping that that part of what they do real. So. Awesome. Um, so a lot of native plant purists kind of turn their nose up at cultivars of native right. plants, native ours. What's Izel's sort of philosophy of right. native ours? And like what sort of education do you do about like the difference between them? Right. So good question. So Izel, um, when, when it was founded, so the, the founders started with really straight species. So fairly, um, you know, not not selling cultivars um, of native plants, but over time they came to recognize there was a demand for that and that for people to, um, often that was the gateway for people to really <laughs> understand and be interested in native plants. Exactly. If they could find something that would better fit their perception of a garden plant. Mm -hmm. And so over time, Izel has added native cultivars, um, but the cool thing about the website, which, and I have nothing to do with this. It was already there when I got there, but um, they, um, it works really well to filter so that you can decide I only want straight species. I mm. want to ignore cultivars. I don't want to see that. So there are many ways to filter for um, native to your state, um, you know, different conditions, only looking at straight species. So um, Izel casts a wide net, but we don't, carry any introduced species. So, or for example, there's a cultivar that is maybe a hybrid between a native mm. cultivar and an introduced one. Yeah. We typically do not carry those because yeah. we want people to be able to know this is something that is either a species that is native um, to, in most cases, the Eastern US because we, we do have a limited shipping range. We really don't ship out past, um, I think Oklahoma, and I, I should know this better, but I really don't do much with sales, <laughs> but um, just simply because of the time frame, and we yeah. want it to get there in a few days. Yeah. Um, but and, also and alive and get there and alive, <laughs> and also that the grower partners we have right now. Yep. Um, but so, and I lost my train of thought. But um, you know, um, we do offer native cultivars as well, and and I do like I I just prefer the word cultivar. I know Alan Armitage. Uh, you know, coined native R, but yeah. to me, it's it's redundant. So, yeah, it, or, you it know, is. it's not necessary. So, I just love to talk about. I think it's cultivars. almost an antagonistic to call it uh, native R's. I think that really gets people going. Yeah, that's, uh, but and and we do we do care about and think about um, are those cultivars providing the same kind of um, obviously wildlife support yep. or um, do they function the same way? Now we're not those kinds of scientists we yeah. try to read and find out mm -hmm. figure out you know are we going to carry a double triple echinacea that has no fertile flowers yeah probably not yeah. Um, because it really just doesn't serve um the 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 plant community and our thought of being holistic about the kinds of gardens we'd like to see, right. you know, um, it, we really do care about it being a part of a functioning ecosystem that is, you know, sustainable, stable, provides those, those ecological benefits. Um, yeah. That's, that's good to have that fabric. Yeah. I, I think it's, you know, that's the touchstone really. Yeah. Yeah. For us. 
Okie dokie. So we have maybe like five minutes left. So I think we can wrap this up with one final fun question. Okay. Uh, Rick's asking Shannon, what plants are on your hot list for the future? Ooh. Ooh wow. Okay. Hmm. I have to think for one moment. That's always hard to ask, like right off the, the bat. And I always, I, I, I wish I had written some things down yeah. like that. Whenever I, will, whenever I get asked that question, yeah, it's well, like, you can't I, think in the moment. I'm going to, I'm going to twist the question just a little bit Please do. Um, b b because I'm in a position that I can. Um, <laughs> I, I, what's really hot to me right now are ground covers. Yeah. Weirdly. Mm. I mean, part of that is my thinking at Izel that like, you know, that small size, what's accessible for people when they want to cover a big area or recognizing that um, that that is literally the foundation of a garden and of mm -hmm. a planting. It also is a Carex bias, to be honest. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, Carex fit into that. It came back to Carex. <laughs> but because of course. Um, but, but I, so for example, Chrysogonums, I mentioned that earlier mm -hmm. that, um, uh, you know, there's Chrysogonum virginianum. In my understanding, there's some shifting around. We may have some different species so yeah. that, you know, you can have one that really stays put, doesn't spread. You can have one, the Australi um, species that move around. Um, it's such a tough plant. Oh, it is. It just, it, it will handle everything. Mm -hmm. So it's not new, but I think our understanding of botanically, what are those species, which cultivars are actually yeah. which species. Yep. Um, uh, I've been talking to Tony too much, apparently. And then he's, <laughs> he's got, it's like, well, we're going to move him around. Um, so Chrysogonums are great. Um, I, Baptisia. There's a lot of cool stuff going on with mm -hmm. Baptisia. There are, if you are um, open to cultivars, there are a lot of so um, many different just, colors oh, and variations. Are, yeah. And, yeah. And I'm appreciating as a landscape plant, it functions a lot like a shrub. Yeah. You know, it, it takes a while to mature, but, mm -hmm. but man, once it gets that taproot down, it's, it's great for, it's a great plant for erosion control on slopes. You know, mm -hmm. it does things. It's, full sun it has pollinator support it looks great it, it's winter just, interest yeah the seed pods so yeah. it's it's um that's one that's and i know there's a lot of um there are a lot of selections out there mm -hmm. people are looking and out in the wild they're hybridizing there are lots of options for that um that's another one um and i, I will say grasses are really experiencing a lot of attention um that um looking more at the native species and not that's just not from coming from kind of more of a native plant person yeah. there is in the industry a lot more interest in broadening the palette mm -hmm. of native grasses um, and looking more at ones for maybe shade conditions or small or interim ones you know so many are large and yep. they're more than folks can really handle in some gardens you know are there other ones yeah the arundo um it's uh and you know <laughs> Are there native species that will fill those niches? So those are some of the- Those are good ones. The those hot ones, ones for me. Yeah, absolutely. Great, well, I think that is all the time we have time for today. So thank you, Shannon, so much for coming out and doing this oh. with us. It was thoroughly enjoyable from start to finish. And oh. thank you, Greg, for, for leading us through this. Yeah. We couldn't have done it without you. Yeah. Greatly appreciate your connection to Shannon. Oh, yeah. it's been my pleasure. Wonderful. And thank you everybody for joining us today. We will be back next week. It'll be the first Monday in October. So we will be doing October gardening tasks with the horticulture crew, whoever that may be on that particular day. <laughs> we will see you all then. Y'all take care. <laughs>